Yeah. So, my earliest memory of Perth, I have a very, very vague memory of actually arriving here on a plane and stepping off the plane and looking up at what I thought was the bluest, cleanest sky I'd ever seen. And I know a lot of migrants tell that story because Perth is such an incredibly clean place. Uh, I was born in hospital. I was born in King Edward Hospital. My parents were living in India at the time and they knew at some stage that they wanted to come and live in Perth. My dad was working for Air India as part of the air crew at the time. My mum's from South Australia and dad and mum met essentially in the sky on, on a flight that, um, that dad was running. And they fell in love and um, I guess for those people that know the film Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, the Sydney Portier film, that was my parents' story really. Love conquering through I guess discrimination and prejudice at the time, my dad being a dark-skinned Muslim Indian and mum being from a conservative Protestant Australian family. So um, both families were against the marriage, so they eloped uh, in 1970 and they had both been to Perth before and loved Perth and had a few friends in Perth, so they decided to elope to Perth and had a small um, wedding with some friends. So Perth always held a very um, affectionate place in their heart and they knew that at some stage when they would have a family they would want to come back to Perth. But and We arrived in Perth in 19, end of 1976, beginning of 1977 and you know Perth was still a very conservative place back then. The, the Asian community, the migrant community were very small, the Muslim community were smaller still. And I suppose in those first couple of years I very much saw the world and Perth through my father's eyes and as I said he was a dark-skinned Muslim immigrant he was educated he was articulate and yet like many immigrants none of his qualifications were recognized so he had to start from the bottom and and I remember even as a little girl of five thinking what a big sacrifice and how brave mum and dad had been because they had a very comfortable familiar lifestyle in, in India and I know my parents used to tell me and my father used to tell me that they made the decision to come to Australia, which, which probably was quite a sacrifice for them in terms of lifestyle, that they made the decision um, willingly uh, because they knew that their family, their children would have a better life here. So it really was a move inspired to give us, um, give me and later on my brother um, a better life, a safer life, more opportunities. And I think that's probably the common story of most migrants that, that move away in, in, in search of a better life. So when I came to Perth, um, to this country, I had a different accent because I'd initially done some infancy schooling um, at an international school that was run by, by Brits. So I came with an English accent and I looked different. I was, I was darker skinned back in those days as well because I spent a lot more time in the sun. And then I had this name, Rabia Sadiq. No one could pronounce it or get their, get their you know, tongue around it, let alone spell it correctly. Uh, I was pe I'd been pestering my parents for a, for a little brother or sister for a while. So I, I suspect in a little way, in some ways, my little brother um, uh, came about to shut me up in some way. <laughs> Um, so when he came along, he was my little ray of sunshine and I would have done everything, anything for him. I was very protective over him. Now, back then, life was different. The idea of leaving my children home alone now fills me with horror. But, you know, life was very different back then. And we lived next door to an older couple in the um, suburb that we started life. And shortly after my parents um, saved enough to, to buy their first house, and uh, we had no family, of course, because mum and dad were outsiders and that was very common for, for immigrants. And this elderly couple, I think, felt sorry for us and took us under their wing. And we became very fond of them, very friendly with them. My brother and I even eventually called them Nan and Pop. They became sort of my surrogate grandparents. Um, but Pop ended up not being a very good man at all. In fact, he was quite an evil man. He was a pedophile and Pop absolutely manipulated and exploited the situation that my brother and I found ourselves in and Pop sexually abused me for many, many months. And like many pedophiles, Pop was very clever and he had identified 
my weakness very early on, which was this love I had for my baby brother. And so um, I suffered in silence for a long time because Pop made it very clear to me and threatened to me that if I told anyone what he was doing, that he would give my brother special time, as he called it. And I couldn't have that. So for a very, very long time, um, I didn't tell anyone about what Pop was doing to me because I thought as long as I remained quiet, I could protect my little brother. And eventually when I told my parents, and I remember the day that everything changed, and it was in the summer holidays and Pop came over after he heard Mum and Dad leave for work. Um, and on this day for the first time, I saw Pop look at my brother with exactly the same expression that he had looked upon me all those months previously and I knew in that moment that I couldn't, there was nothing I could do to protect my brother anymore, that he was going to be his next victim. And so I knew I had to speak up at that stage. And when I told my parents, obviously they were mortified, they were heartbroken. But that's when I started learning about how culture very much influences decisions we make and how we live our life. And that's when I started understanding or started being exposed to a concept that I would understand much later on, which is to a large extent, we're not only the product of our experiences and our childhood, but we're the product of our culture as well. And I guess in our culture, in Asian culture, in Muslim culture, as, as is the case in many cultures, um, that, that concept of shame is so core to decisions that you make, to the public face that you show people. And after getting over the horror, my parents, I remember, started having discussions about how could we as outsiders, as a, as a very much still an outside family, how could we progress in this city, in this country, in this, in this beautiful place, with the shame that the abuse would undoubtedly bring on the family name. And so, rightly or wrongly, mum and dad decided um, that we would no longer speak about the abuse, that it was covered up, the police were never called, Pop was never brought to justice, and I was told never to speak of what I had been through to anyone. So school during that time became my haven because it became the place that I felt safe and, and uninhibited. And I was so fortunate because for me it wasn't so much about private or public, it was about the environment that was created in this school. And the environment was one where every student's differences and uniquenesses were celebrated. We were all encouraged to um, be ourselves and to realise our full potential. And I absolutely thrived in that environment. And I, I firmly believe that that environment that I found myself in, that my, my parents created uh, um, as an opportunity for me, is what saved me.